want to move on to this other thing which is linked to this and that is this claim of the prophet how around the circumstances of how the prophet married his jewish his wife who was of jewish uh, ancestry safiya radiyallahu anha now there's a video that went viral of Tommy Robinson and some of the far right that keep using this point. Those of you just tuning in, I want you to click like, click share. I want you to get this out there because I want people to have access to this. All right. So <clears throat> there's this video out there where some Muslim is debating. He's chasing Tommy Robinson to debate him. And Muslims do this. And I want to ask you, right, look. Please, for the love of God, don't do these things. Right? Leave it. Honestly, you are not that capable. And I respect that you guys might do a lot of good things. People might do a lot of good things. I respect that. But these issues, you do Islam much more harm than you do good. You know, your five minute fame of like, wow, I attacked a... Um, you know, I confronted a far right person, right? And Muslims are going to all clap for you and like, you know, kiss your behind, right? This is no good because the harm you are doing Islam is so, it so outweighs this, right? Honestly. So in this discussion, the person, the first thing this person asks him, is it true that the Prophet, after murdering his, the, uh, uh, the father and the husband of Safiya, took her as his own and had her on that night? Is this true? And this guy says, yes, so. Wow. Wow. I am genuinely lost for words. What do you mean? Yes, so. And then he says, back to Tommy Robinson, and this is just one example. He says, but where does it say in the books that he raped her? Are you for real? If I got a woman who's just been married, Killed her husband according to this narration in front of her, killed her father, dragged her away as my slave and had sex with her that night. I really doubt that is going to be a sense of romantic passion between the two of us. Of course, that's going to be goddamn rape. What do you think she's going to do? So what do you mean? Where does it say that's rape? That is not what happened. Why are you conceding to that? Why are you accepting this and allowing them to circulate this nonsense? So, right, so first of all, so I want to make that point clear that, look, please, these issues are intricate issues. The issue of Islamic history is intricate because there's so much nonsense that's being transmitted. There's truth as well. There's nonsense as well. Don't just, if you haven't studied Islam, don't go out there being the voice of Islam. Right? Just back out a bit. Let your ego take a little hit. It's okay. And then he affirms, yes, so what? That Aisha was nine years old. She was developed. What the hell? What do you mean developed? What kind of a sick response is that? Developed nine-year-old. What do you mean? This is the prophet of God. If this was any other man, you would condemn it. So you're saying it's okay for your prophet to do all these things. So I have answered in detail. I have made an elaborate video about the age of Aisha. So watch it. And, and seriously, what disappoints me is that some of these people have seen it. And they do know this, this narrative. But they still refuse to, and they want to tell this kind of, this, this anti-Islamic, Islamophobic narrative of the Prophet marrying a child. And I find that blasphemous. I'm going to be honest with you. But now let's get back to this point of this 
in, uh, this issue about Safiya. Right now, Safiya radiallahu an. Now, just to give you some background, she, uh, she, she, she was a Jewish woman from a tribe of uh, from Bani Nadib that lived in a place called Khaybar, and her father was one of the chief people, right? So, uh, his name is Huyay uh, ibn Akhtab. Huyay ibn Akhtab. And he had met the Prophet before, um, on a few occasions. He was one of the most kind of vile people against the Prophet. What's interesting is his brother, Abu Yasir, embraced Islam very early on and still lived with them in Khaybar. And Abu Yasir embraced Islam and he actually would often plead with them and about Islam, you know, stop misrepresenting Islam and stuff like this. Uh, now... The battle of Khaybar takes place. There's some disagreement, like as there always is. There's nothing. Listen to one point. Let's get one point clear. Nothing is concrete in Islamic history. There's dis differences on everything. So there's some dis there's disagreement on when the battle of Khaybar took place. Let's go with a mainstream, a popular view of it was in 7 Hijri. The 7th Hijri. Some say Imam Malik said it was in 6th Hijri. But either way, 7th Hijri. Now it happens after Hudaybiyah. Because these were the huge fronts that were threatening the civilization in Medina. So when you had the Battle of Ahzab and stuff like this. Uh, people who got all these tribes, the coalition against. To kind of demolish and wipe out everybody. You know, man, woman and child in Medina. But they failed. The key people behind this were like the Quraysh in Mecca. They were these people from Khaybar, Bani Nadir. Now, Bani Nadir had also family in Bani Quraytha. And, and so they had got Bani Quraytha onto it. So Bani Quraytha were to attack when the trenches. And that's a whole different topic. You can listen to that uh, another time or do your research on it. And so the whole Muslim civilization had been under threat by these key powers. Now... In the battle of Hud not the battle, but in the treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet had a treaty with the people in Mecca that they would have a peace treaty. So once he had a bit of security from them, because of the constant threat from Khaybar, he did go to Khaybar. And they vary. Some people say it was only the people, popularly, they say it was only the people of Hudaybiyah that went to Khaybar. They go to this place to, for, for battle. Now, there was something like 1,400 people, some Muslims, some say there were 1,500, 1,600. They were around that kind of amount. Now, Khaybar was in fortresses. Now, the Arabs never normally had fortresses. So they weren't used to how to battle with fortresses. So these people had fortresses and they had eight key fortresses, five spaced out, then three separate behind. Uh, and these were... I'm just giving you a little picture, and this is where the battle kind of takes place. It's one fortress at a time. Now, anyway, moving fast forwarding on to this point. The battle, the Muslims eventually win the battle. Um, it's, it's a very tif a difficult kind of thing. It lasts several weeks. Eventually, the Muslims do win it. Uh, several Muslims are killed. Uh, I think over 80 Muslims get killed during this battle amongst them there's a famous companion muhammad ibn maslama his brother mahmoud ibn maslama is killed by safiya's father or by safiya's husband and there's a difference of opinion um and arguably he is the person who retaliates but at the end of this amongst the people safiya leaves with the muslims and goes now i want us to pause here okay Right. I, I want to now tell you what the, the narrative that is being pushed around is and then what the truth is. OK, so let's I gave you the background and inshallah in the future, maybe I'll do a detailed video on this. But right now for us to have an understanding. So this is now the narrative that is being pushed even by several Muslims, unfortunately, that the prophet, after being victorious, brought out. Um, Kinana was her husband and he was obviously one of the key people uh, and her father Huyay 
and had them tied up and executed. She was dragged out. And then, then there's some variations. Some people say she was taken as spoils of war. So, uh, and she was given to this person called Dihya al Kalbi. And th this, this, these narrations that I'm telling you now are not true, but I'm, I'm telling you this is what people push. This is the narrative, right? So she was taken by Dihya al Kalbi, and then the Prophet took her from him. Because she was known to be so beautiful. She was so beautiful that the Prophet took her from uh, Dihya al-Kalbi and said uh, to her, look, why don't you marry me? Or, like, you've got a choice. Like, you can either be a slave or you can marry me. And she says, okay, I'll marry you. And then the Prophet in some narrations, uh, consummates that marriage, is intimate with her. According to some people, that night, night after, or whatever, a few nights later, these are the kind of stories being pushed around. And also, she is hateful of the Prophet in the beginning. In some, she says, oh, I detest you, and stuff like this in some narrations. Now, all of these things are nonsense people these are all rubbish right now let me get to the true narrative the truth is that we have a lot of narrations a lot and we've got several in Bukhari we've got several in other books Almost all of these narrations to do with this marriage of Safiya come predominant, almost all of them. I, I mean, there may be one or two other ones. Otherwise, generally, they all come through just Anas, radiallahu anhu. Only Anas is transmitting this story. Okay. There is so much conflict and ittirab. What the muhaddithin call ittirab is when narrations conflict so massively, none of them are reliable okay now there's so much it there are in this story from Anas they're all from Anas and they're all the conflicting narrations are in Bukhari they conflict with each other they're in Bukhari they're in the books of Ibn Ishaq they're in the books of the Tabaqat in the Tariq books and other things they're there they're all there and they all conflict so let's take a look at the kind of conf uh, we're going to take a look at the kind of conflicts that we're dealing with now what I believe is that in these narrations, there are some truths lying somewhere that have over time been distorted. Okay, because they can't all be true. They're all conflicting. They're all kind of making, uh, they don't add up. So there may be some truths, but somewhere along the line, some people have distorted this. They've made mistakes. Some people have been forgetful. Some people have done rewire bil ma'na, interpreted things according to meaning. Anas radiallahu an was the long, one of the longest, uh, the, uh, one of the oldest companion, one of the companions to reach such an old age. So, when this incident is happening, he is around, maybe he's a teenager, maybe sixteen years old, something like that. Okay, when this incident is happening. He is the one transmitting all these stories. He dies in 93 Hijri, okay, which means he dies over having lived over a hundred years of age. So he's one of the most, uh, one of the companions with the most kind of longest lived lives, if you like, like that died with such seniority in age that he lived over a hundred years. Now, so along the way, you can imagine whether it comes from him, that people taking it from him over old age, uh, or they're transmitting with meaning, or people are putting their own kind of interpretations into this, and people are transmitting the story, and they're transmitting it on from them, and they're transmitting it on from them, right down to Bukhari himself, who's hearing this and transmitting. And Bukhari himself, by the way, transmits with meaning. He's one of the scholars that transmits with meaning. So when he is asked, Bukhari himself says that, oh, the ahadith I used to listen to in Basra, I would write them in Baghdad. And the ones I heard in Baghdad, I would write in Misr. 
in Egypt. And the person asks him, Bikamalihi, what the whole of it? And says, the Masakat. He just went quiet because it's impossible to write the whole thing. So it's important to understand these. Now let's take a look. So this Tafarrud, first of all, the, with Anas. Anas is the key person to transmit all these riwayat. Now these riwayat, here are some of the conflicts. Some of them say she uh, was a slave girl and stayed a slave. Some of them say no, she was a free person, so the Prophet took her as a slave girl. Some of them say the Prophet married her. Okay, some of them say that no, she was given to Dihya al-Kalbi, who the Prophet took her from. Some of these riwayat say that, oh, Dihya al-Kalbi said, I want to take a different slave girl with her. Another narration says, no, he never said that. He said, oh, I want you, I want, you can buy her using certain uh, cattle and things like this, seven sabat al he took uh, in place. Then, and these are all narrations coming like from places like Bukhari and stuff like this, all conflicting. Some of them say, well, okay, uh, the Prophet then married her in a place called uh, the uh, Sadduroha. Some of them say, no, he married her in a place called Saddu Sahba, in a different place altogether. Right, okay. Some of them say, no, he didn't marry her until he got to Medina. Some of these narrations say they ca the Prophet and these people came back from Khaybar directly, without any delay, they came to Medina. Other narrations say no, they came from a different place called Asfan. They'd gone to Asfan instead and they came back from Asfan. Okay. Uh, some of them, these narrations say, oh, the Prophet uh, consummated his marriage from that night. Some of them say no, a few nights later. Some of them say no, until he didn't get back to Medina. Okay. Now, uh, some of these narrations say, how was she, how did she come to the Prophet? Some people say they caught her in, 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 in the fortress. Other people say no, in the narrations, no, they caught her in, uh, she was in the street and she came herself. I'm just trying to show you contradictions in what are authentic narrations. Those of you just tuning in, if you can click like, click share, get this out there. Then I'm going to explain what is the true narrative and how these things got got messed up. Uh, some of these narrations say she used to actually fancy the Prophet. That This is before she even became Muslim. Uh, some of them say no, she hated him on the day and said, I don't want to uh, be... Uh, married to you. Some of them say she didn't embrace Islam, some of them straight away. Some of them say she did embrace Islam straight away. Uh, some of them say that, oh, uh, she, she may have been upset, let's say, if you want to accept those narrations by Ibn Ishaq about her husband being killed. Some of them say she was beaten black and blue by her husband and the Prophet actually asks her about that and I'll explain a bit about that. Um, now, so I'm just trying to take a look at some of these things. Okay, now you can see the kind of confusion going on. And these are all, all narrated by the same person. That they're coming from this place. No, they're coming from that place. No, they came straight away. No, they took their time. No, they didn't get married till they got back there. No, they did get married when they were there. No, she became Muslim. No, she didn't become Muslim till later on. No, she was still a slave girl. No, she wasn't a slave girl. She was a wife straight away. Oh, no, she did used to fancy the Prophet and she was like this, this story. No, no, she didn't like the Prophet at the day. Uh, she uh, No, she was held as a captive from inside the fortress and brought... No, she was actually already standing there. No, she was... Right, so we've got a lot of nonsense. A lot of noise. Now, people have to filter through. Now, let me tell you what actually happened, people. Okay. I'd like you to click like, click share. First of all, what is very clear is Sophia leaves with the Muslims. This is clear. Fact. Sophia, at some stage in her life, does become the wife of the Prophet. That is a fact. We accept that. These two are facts. It's the things in between that have been mixed up. Now, let me clarify this to you people. First of all, it is impossible 
that the Prophet married her then? Impossible. Why, you ask me? Right? He posted no evidence, right? Okay, why is it impossible? Because it clearly goes against the Qur'an. Clearly. Clearly goes against the Qur'an. Right? Her husband did die in that battle. And that he was one of the chief people. And obviously it was a battle. So he did die. There's no denying that. And he had murdered the brother of Muhammad ibn As Maslama, whose name was uh, Mahmoud ibn Maslama, and it was Muhammad ibn Maslama who killed him in retaliation for his brother. Now, the husband had died. Okay, fine. So she's a widow. What does the Quran say about widows? minkum, And those who die amongst you, and their wives are left behind, يَتَرَبَّسْنَا بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ That they must sit an idda. أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَعَشْرًا They must sit an idda of four months and ten days. فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَلَا جَنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ That once they reach their ajal, they can get married. Allah has said that in the Qur'an. In the Quran. So the first assumption is that are you saying the Prophet went against this clear verse in the Quran? So some people have tried to say, well, oh no, there was a hadith of Ghazwa to Autas when the Prophet said, oh, if there was a female captive, you can, she doesn't have to sit, a, f a female captive can just sit an idda of one menstrual cycle. First of all, that's Absurd because the Ghazwa to Autas hadn't even happened yet. It was going to happen one or two years after this event. Two, right, for two, that was not speaking about widows. Three, there's problems in that chain to start off with. Four, even if you tried to take that understanding of a menstrual cycle, how could it be that same day that the Prophet marries her or the next day according to these stories? It doesn't make any sense. The, are you telling me the Prophet himself does not, under, does not know the Qur'an? And he's going against the Qur'an. So, okay, let's get that point. So the Prophet did not marry her there. So why are they thinking he married her? Let's go to one of the hadith that Anas transmits. This is once again Sahih. He says, we discussed the companions. We discussed what is the idda for. The idda can be for pregnancy or it can be for a state of mourning. Right now, he says, we discussed, we saw Safiya go with the Prophet and we discussed, has he married her? This is Anas saying, because by the way, nobody knew, witnessed this nikah of the Prophet with Safiya. Nobody witnessed it. So the Prophet never had witnesses and things. Nobody witnessed it. So Anas in a Sahih, it says, we asked, so, oh, is she going with him as a captive or is he married to her? And then they see that the Prophet, she sits with the Prophet and the Prophet, and I'm going to get to this, had given her something to cover with. So they assume, they say, oh, because we saw her covered in a dignified way, we, she must be his wife. Now they stop at a location where they have a celebration. And Anna says, oh, this must be the Walima. Now let me pause here and go back to the, the incident, what's happened. When Khaybar collapses, and they had caused a lot of torment to the Muslims, and they had murdered several Muslims, and yes, her father... And her, because he was the chief person, the key right, one of the key rivals of the Prophet was her father, right? He 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 does die in that battle, as does her husband, who is also a key person in that whole tribe. Now, <coughs> what is known about Safiya it, from before her uncle, her father's brother Abu Yasir, had been Muslim for years. 
He had been a Muslim, Abu Yasir. He visits the Prophet. He is known to have supported the Prophet. He always spoke well of him. There are narrations, Sahih narrations, that Safiya did know about the Prophet. She used to speak well about him. In fact, she had been recently married to this chief for tribal reasons, who she says to him, I had a dream. And she says, in the dream, I saw a moon landing in my lap. She never mentions the Prophet's name or anything. What does... Right? What does... <coughs> right, now, what does her husband say? Her husband... Right, right. Please don't distract too much in the comments. I'm going to block people if you are being too distractive. I did mention that there's a difference between the idda of a widow and the idda of a divorcee. That's obviously common basic knowledge. Everybody knows stuff like that. Right, okay. Now, she tells her husband, I saw this moon land in my lap. What does her husband do? He says to her, you want, you, you are obsessed with that Muhammad. She doesn't mention the Prophet Muhammad's name. He says, and he's the person you want to be with. And he punches her up so bad that she is actually bruised. In the hadith, Sahih hadith, once again, when she, in the battle of, once the battle of Khaybar is over, she comes to the Prophet. Her eye is all green with bruises. And the Prophet asks her, Why, what happened to you? And she says, Kinana beat me up. And, and the Prophet asks her, why? And, and, and she says, because I had this dream. Now, obviously, a lot is going on because there's a whole battle. Everything has settled, things like this. People make disparaging comments about her. People say, oh, Yehudiya, Yehudiya, Jewish woman, this, that. And the Prophet tells them off. He tells them off. This is in a Sahih Hadith. He tells them off. Some people held her as a captive. They wanted to hold her as a captive. The Prophet freed her. He did not marry her. He freed her. Now, because people were showing animosity towards her, the Prophet said to her, Ride with me. Now this is, I know to, today some Muslims go kind of like, you know, they, taqwa, they have like a taqwa attack and stuff like this. But there's several other hadith where the Prophet has gone on his camel and he's gone past Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, seen her walking, carrying, and he said, listen, why don't you get on the camel with me? Come with me. And she says, no, I don't want. These kind of things were common. That's a sahih hadith about Asma. So the Prophet says to her, that listen, you ride with me. And it mentions in the hadith that you hawwilaha, that al -aba a, that he got a cloth and laid it out on the camel for her to sit. And he and it mentions he kind of bowed his knee. The Prophet, this is in a Sahih hadith. The Prophet bowed his knee. And she stepped on his knee and climbed onto this camel. When people are being so rude to her, this was the akhlaq of the Prophet towards her. He did not marry her. He did not. He freed her, told them off from abusing her, said to her, listen, why don't you ride with me? Because they were abusing her because she was obviously a Jew, Jewish person. She, and they obviously just had this huge battle. And himself lowers for her to step on his, on his knee and climb onto this camel. When in the Sahih Hadith, when they're coming back, the, they have an incident where the camel falls over and the Prophet hurts himself as well. And it's a well-documented incident. I mean, not severely, but he hurts himself. And she falls off. And what does the Prophet do? And remember, this is her in this kind of devastated state. The Prophet gets his cloak and puts it round her and covers her. This is in the hadith. He did not marry her. 
Now they come back to Medina. Look at the way the akhlaq that the Prophet had demonstrated towards her. She would have been naturally somebody in her idda. The Prophet has not approached her. Anas is assuming because she's riding with the, the Prophet and because the Prophet is showing this, oh, maybe she's married to him. Because he says, we discussed, is she married to him? Is she his captive? What's going on? They don't know. When they stop at Saddus Roha, they mentioned during Khaybar, by the way, they laid siege to these fortresses. They were starving. Muslims were starving at some of the fortresses. They mentioned that they were so, because it was so difficult for them. They didn't have that much preparation. Now, even though they did get food and stuff when they had conquered, when they stop at Saddu Rawha and Saddu Sahba, they have a feast for victory. So they have some food. Now, Anas assumes, or the people transmitting assume, oh, is this because he got married? This is an assumption. This did not happen. There was no nikah that took place. It would have been haram. She was in her idda anyway. And the Prophet had not, she hadn't even embraced Islam. It doesn't make any sense. But yes, she was sympathetic to the Prophet from before because her uncle, who was very dear to her, loved the Prophet. And remember, she used to, she had, used to get beat up by her husband because he used to assume that, oh, she took a liking to the Prophet. When she gets back to Medina, the Prophet told her, why don't you stay at such and such a person's house? She didn't live with the Prophet. She stayed with Umm Salim and with other people in their house. This is what the books show. Now, in that time, even Aisha radiallahu anha and other people made some derogatory comments towards her. And the Prophet told them off. They said about, oh, that Jew. And the Prophet said, don't say that. What's wrong with you people? Why are you being like that towards her? Now, during, after this time, as time goes on, she does embrace Islam. She sees this kind of, in, because think about it, in this, in this might of victory, the attitude of the Prophet towards her, even when he saw her at Khaybar with a green, bruised eye, and he doesn't, amidst all this confusion, he asks her, hey, what, what happened to you? I mean, did one of the Muslims do this? And she says, no, it was my husband beat me up. Then saying, hey, come with me. Stay, because he saw some of them were mocking her. Then covering her when she fell off the camel. Giving her a place to stay. He did not marry. She does embrace Islam in time to come. In the months that followed, she does. And then she herself is interested in the Prophet and they do get married. That is a fact. But it is inaccurate, inaccurate to assume that this all happened in one night in the Battle of Khaybar. It is absurd because there's no way she embraces Islam and does this and she sits her idda and she does this and she does that. It doesn't make any sense. So these were some of the key points I wanted to mention that, look, yes, it is true that she did marry the Prophet. But marriage requires consent in Islam. Everybody accepts that she married the Prophet. She would have had to consent to that. And Anas being the key transmitter, somebody who's 16 years old at the time, and people transmitting from him over his lengthy lifetime. These things have become subjected to interpretate. There were so many clashing narrations from Anas, countless all contradicting each other. So when you, you, so what you have to do, and he does mention these things. Anas mentions, oh, I saw the prophet uh, lay out a cloth for her. I saw the prophet put out his knee and she stepped on his knee. This is all Anas. Anas they, uh, transmits that, oh, I saw that, you know, that her eye was beaten up and, and the prophet was talking to her. I saw this kind of stuff. And other people transmit some of these stories about Khaybar as well. In these incidents. Now what's interesting is when the Muslims get back and they're celebrating and they've got all these spoils of war, Abu Huraira has arrived 
And what does Abu Huraira say? He transmits, and this is in the Muatta of Malik and in Bukhari as well. He says from the Battle of Khaybar, they didn't bring anything. He says, Ma ghanimu lam yughnam. There was not taken as spoils of war except illal ghanam wal bakar wa thiyab. Except clothing, uh, cows and sheep. He says no wealth and he mentions no women. There was none of these captives and slaves and stuff like this. This is Abu Huraira's hadith in the Muatta of Imam Malik, in the Sahih al-Bukhari once again. So you need to look, as Muslims, we need to look at the greater picture. Yes, hadith come to us, there's many hadith. Sometimes they conflict, especially on historical accounts. Because these things didn't get documented till generations later. So when it's something very important like this, you have to weigh it up against the teachings of the Quran to start off with. What does the Quran say? How it is impossible that the Prophet is preaching to people about Idda, women, widows have this Idda, but then himself is like, hey, take Sophia, it doesn't matter. That is impossible. It is impossible that she accepts, the Prophet is saying there is no compulsion in Islam, but then forces her to become Muslim. It is impossible that she lives with the Prophet happily and does all these things. And her husband's just been killed and he's been killed and she's been dragged away and all this. And that night she's been turned into a sex slave and stuff like this. It is impossible impossible these kind of things can it is impossible that all these things happen all these narrations which are all in books like bukhari and they all contradict each other that you know no this person has it no he buys it with this no he buys it with that no they stop here no they don't stop here no they celebrate here no they don't celebrate here they, they get married straight away no they don't get married straight away no they marry in medina no they marry in this place you know no they they can't all be, they, this is Yes, there's some truths and you have to analyze these things. You have to understand that, look, all of them are only coming through Anas. One person is transmitting everything and it's all conflicting. So, okay, we've got a problem. Why have we got a problem? Because it's impossible that that is the character of the Prophet. We have to be so weary how we teach how we teach and relay the, prophet, the Prophet's character. You cannot relay him like this. And it is a lie against, against the Prophet. I'm serious that when I watch these things, you know, even today, some Muslim just said to me, yes, so what? The Prophet gave her a choice. Embrace, you know, you can stay a slave or I can free you and you can be my wife. And this was a scholar saying this to me today. Wallahi, it shocks me that how can you think so low of the Prophet? And you say, yeah, but it doesn't matter if the Prophet did it, it must be right. What do you mean if the, the Prophet, first of all, the Prophet wouldn't do something like that? Why, why, are you, why are you projecting this nonsense onto the Prophet? He didn't do that. Why are you, to, I mean, why are you so quick to accept that? I mean, have you even analyzed what's going on? Have you even looked at the text? They conflict with each other. Why are you so quick to... That shows the... Pro You're just saying, yes, so what if the Prophet was barbaric and, uh, and just raped us? So what? But if he did it, it was okay. But he didn't do that. Why are you accepting this? And then, and then to say, but show me the word rape is stupid. It's stupid. Because obviously that, the picture you're drawing is rape. There is no other picture. It doesn't, whether, you know, it doesn't, actions speak louder than words. So it is unacceptable to do these kind of things. And look, you wouldn't tolerate this for anybody else. Why teach it as the actions of the Prophet? Because it is, wallahi, it is not true. This is what I'm saying. So I am urging people, Muslims especially, please, you know, for the love of God, do not transmit 
stories like that about the Prophet snatching Sophia, taking her, having her on that night. This is not true. You are degrading, you're throwing the Messenger of God off, you know, his honor off a cliff. So have just pause and think for a moment what you are doing. Just think about it. These things, wallahi, they are not acceptable. They are not acceptable. If any other man was to do them, you would be up in arms. So why are you ascribing them to the Prophet? And you say, yeah, but it's in Bukhari. But there's so many conflicting narrations in Bukhari about this incident. And all oh, this incident only comes from one company. You're telling me the Prophet got married and nobody but Anas knew. Only Anas knew that. And even Anas himself in Bukhari, in these narrations, is saying, oh, we weren't sure. Did he get married? Didn't he get married? Because there were no witnesses. So he says, I don't know. Let's, he says, let's wait if he covers her up. Then th th that will be, that means it's his wife. No, it doesn't mean that. That may have been an interpretation. So I hope, inshallah, this makes some sense and we have to look afresh at things. People will say, look, people will say that, oh, I want to know all the scholars that have agreed with this understanding, this narrative before you. Look, we are not held to account by the understanding of people before us. They were amazing legends. They were great geniuses. But their own culture, their own age influenced their perception. To some people, they may have heard this story and thought, well, okay. Rather than questioning it, they may have thought, well, because a thousand years ago, 1200 years ago, the world was a brutal place. So they may have thought, oh, yes, yeah, so it doesn't matter. But it does matter. So just because they didn't choose to question certain things, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you turn a blind eye. We today are so desperately in need, wallahi, to, to review and revisit any attacks on Islam in light of our understanding. We need to do these things. Allah is addressing us in the Quran. Do you not have reason? Forget about them. What about you? Let, let, let me relay a story to you. You know, they say about Albert Einstein that in 1942, he was a professor in Oxford University. And he had a senior class of physics students and he gave them an exam. And after the exam, his assistant said to him, he said to him, you know, pr professor, he said, am I not wrong in understanding that that was exactly the same exam you gave these students last year? And Einstein said, he said, yes, it is. And he goes, well, Einstein, Professor Einstein, how can you do that? How can you do that? How can you give these senior physics students the same exam they had last year? And he said, oh, but the answers have changed. You see, this, this is the thing. Because the time had changed. What he meant is that we today have certain perspectives on certain things that maybe we didn't last year. So don't be projecting and don't, we, look, stop this dogma and sectarian. Don't just say to me, oh, Ibn Hajar said it's okay, so it's okay. I respect Ibn Hajar. I may love him from that academic sense. You know, I read upon his things. I, I love these scholars, Noah, we call the Yad, but I'm not, you know, we don't have to be sheep and blind follow and d throw the honor of the Prophet just for our loyalty to a sect or to a group or to know. So the honor of the messengers, the honor of Islam comes first. Okay, then you can be, that's what we're loyal to first and foremost. People have taken way too long today. I just thought this was really important of a topic. I, um, you know, I heard, <laughs> I'm losing my voice now. I heard this and uh, wallahi, I'm being on, it hurt me. 
to watch that, I had to actually just switch it off. I saw these clips and I thought to myself, we don't need Islamophobes to attack Islam. Muslims have done such a great job of it themselves. So it really bothered me. And then so, some people had reached out to me with the similar question. And I thought it's definitely it's necessary to kind of shed some understanding that I have. Perhaps, you know, it will make sense to you in the hope that you guys can, inshallah, part this further um, and take it to others, inshallah.